Pocket Party. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you for joining me on the Pocket Party Podcast. If it's your first time listening, thank you. Welcome aboard. This show is at episode 243. You probably already knew that. I'm a been, I've been a comic for well over 25 years, and we'll get into that. And uh, what else can I tell you? I love podcasting. It keeps me in touch with the listeners, the fans, and reaching new fans around the world. And this is a great comedian. His name is Mike Black. <laughs> and if you love this episode, listen to many more episodes with Mike Black. And he just answered the phone, I believe. Is this Mr. Yes. Mike Black? Yes, uh, what's happening? <laughs> what's, ha- what's happening? I wasn't sure if it was you or your butler. Is this one of those robocalls? No, no. I, I don't want to subscribe. <laughs> I'm not going to give you my credit card. Yeah. Wow. Look, so, wow. Did, you sound a little different. Do you, have a, do you have a cold or did I wake you up? I'm a little under the weather. Wow. Uh, I, uh, I was at uh, San Diego Comic Con all this last weekend. Nice. And uh, it was a lot of fun, but I walked more than I've walked the entire year. Wow. Every day that I was there. Oh, my gosh. It was a lot like one of your bumpkin activities, only (laughs) this was fun and for uh, real cool people to enjoy. (laughs) You guys, we're going to get into that country bumpkin activities. <laughs> I love. It. I went to the because I went to the LA County Fair, and you know what's funny is I also walked more. In two days, I walked more than I had because the the day before I, I walked about ten or eleven miles, all over like Burbank and Griffith Park and just epic exercise. But, but I, you like it. You I like. Yeah, walk. and then exactly, and then the next day it was uh, I was at the fair and I was pretty much had no other option and. And, uh, yeah, dude, I can only imagine what it was. Yeah, but I build up to it. Like, maybe this could be a thing. You could start training for com- for Comic-Con. That could be your, your thing. Yeah, I That's- guess. For, for me, it was like, you remember in The Little Mermaid when she first had legs? Yeah. It was a, a little bit like that. It was more like in The, in the Matrix when uh, he says, uh, my eyes are hurting, and uh, Morpheus replies, it's because it's the first time you've used them. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how my whole body felt. <laughs> uh, that, uh, but it was it was still a lot of fun. One day, uh, for me and for anyone who's fat, this is a big deal. Yeah, you know, how your a, step counter says ten thousand. Yeah, but I've never hit ten thousand like in a normal. Year. Do you have a Fitbit or do you have a step counter? I, uh, yeah, I have one. I I look at it with mild amusement. I don't really use it for anything. <laughs> but uh, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. When I look <laughs> at my uh, step counter, uh, it I, the only thing I can chart with it is the days that Jesus carried me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. Clearly, <laughs> there's no way I only walked 20 steps, so clearly jesus was carrying me <laughs> right Did you, but uh yeah. is uh, one day of comic-con i don't know every day but one day i walked fifteen thousand steps oh yeah that's oh man that can be done and especially like you said if you're not used to it and you're a heavier guy that's man you must have been in a lot of like pain at the end of the day like wow and that's in shoes that i bought from walmart oh wow not not to say like you can buy good shoes at Walmart, but these were Walmart brand. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, exactly. Like if you have like, I have found when I used to have a lot of foot problems because I was walking every day on the streets, the sidewalks and the roads, like I was walking around the city as opposed to like a park where it's, you know, you're on trails. What were you, a, a detective or something? <laughs> yeah, I was walking the, I was walking the streets, see, pounding walking the, the pavement. The streets. Yeah. The main streets of Burbank. Yeah, around <laughs> around six years ago, seven years ago, I used to just, you know, that was my favorite form of exercise was uh, exercising like a retiree. <laughs> and I would, like, <laughs> I would throw on a couple of podcasts and I'd go for these long walks and podcasting kept me moving because, you know, before I'd go for like a 30 minute walk. But once you're, you get locked into like a good audio book or a podcast, you're like, man, I want to see it. I want to keep going. And, and so I would do like these hour and a half walks and and uh, but i started getting like um i think they call it plantar's fasciitis 
And, oh yeah. yeah. And and uh, and that's because I was wearing like what you just said. I was wearing like the thirty nine dollar cheap shoes, whatever. And you know what, man? One day I went in an audition at, and I was at the New Balance store in Santa Monica. After the, I was like, oh, let me go in here. And I got my feet measured and all that kind of stuff. And maybe it was all hocus pocus and whatever, but I felt like it was real. And I got to be honest, I've never gone back. Once you go, I've never gone back to the cheap shoes when it comes to like exercising on that kind of surface. Like, if, yeah. You know what I mean? Like if it's. Oh yeah, like yeah. on concrete, of course. Yeah, concrete, yeah, for sure. I just I go with the New Balance, and they cost a little more. But you know what, though, my my feet feel good, my back feels good, and they it seems to me like they last longer before they start getting worn down and and all that. And to me, it's totally worth it to get yourself a a good pair of sneakers if you're going to be doing that kind of stuff. Well, I don't. I kind of split the difference. I get okay shoes. Yeah, but I get really good insoles. Oh, yeah. You know, and they have some of them that have, like, the little bumps all over them and oh, memory yeah. foam and arch support. And I'll, I'll really splurge on those. Yeah, I went I went all out that first time I went to New Balance. So they're like, you need the arch support and the insoles. And it was a little too much as far as, like, I felt I wasn't used to it, like the brand new shoes with like the extra soft cushing inside, and then the yeah. insoles, and then the support. I was like, oh, this actually kind of. I know it's correcting my arches, but it kind of hurt in a weird way. And then the gel mm-hmm. part was too soft for my. I was like, this is kind of the whole thing is just too much at once. So, for me personally, I think that the regular New Balance shoes um, are good enough for me. Like they, they have some new technology. I forget what it says on the inside of it. Like something soft. Whatever, they made up some made up word inside, but it seems like it works well. Like foam plus or something, mega plus. I don't know. Oh yeah, have you tried those ones that like kind of make for uh, on purpose make your foot uncomfortable to work out? Oh, I haven't. Have you? Oh, the kind that look like gloves where your each toe goes in its own little separate container. <laughs> have you tried no, those? I, <laughs> I think those are for the ocean. For things you do in the water, uh, <laughs> uh, aqua socks they used to call them, or something where it's like it looks like a glove, but it's for your feet. And I know like a lot of cool people were wearing them around LA about six years ago. Well, there were I know Skechers had a a brand uh, because Brooke Burke used to do stuff about it. But basically, they were shoes that would like put pressure in the wrong areas. Oh, and kind of keep you off balance on purpose so that you were constantly working your legs while you were wearing them, even if you were standing still. Oh, yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, we used to get those. Uh, I think I think we all had those ones. They were, they were made by Skechers, right? Yeah. What were they called? Um, torture. No, yeah, they were called torture because you're right. It did hurt. And then they were like, they're like, you could wear these at work, especially if you work in fast food. You'll, you know. With all these step, is it called steppers or something? Or that's what it was. Can you imagine what a nightmare that would be? First of all, uh, having a job in fast food, but second of all, a job in fast food where your feet are being tortured <laughs> while you're working. I know, I know. Yeah, they were called stetchers. Uh, uh, yeah, like yeah, those things hurt, man. Yeah, it's like yeah, you can do that, but why would you? I know. I remember one year we all got them for Christmas and it was like, at first you're like, oh, this is good. And then I was like, you know what, secretly I don't want to, you know, I'm not really going to wear mine that often because they kind of hurt too much. There's a point too where it's like, how attractive do you really want to be? <laughs> yeah, I know. You know? Yeah. If, if you're like just destroying your body to be yeah. attractive, well, I guess if you're destroying your body to be unattractive either. That's true. But, uh, but yeah, like God, at what cost? Oh yeah, like binding your feet. Like I remember, like didn't they used to do that in China? I think they would purposely make their women would do that to make their feet extra small or something. Well, the it was more like the husbands would do it. I, I don't think women ever were like, you know, what would be great if we had really tiny baby feet. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was more like some weird pervy husbands that were into that <laughs> stuff, and, and were like, honey, you know, what would be awesome. Is if, if we tied up your feet in ribbons and your midsection, uh, just totally crush it. Let's just destroy that thing. <laughs> I remember hearing some urban legend that Elvis 
the only thing he was that he really wasn't into women with big feet. Uh, I mean, that's. But that's. I'm not really either. But I'm not going to make some lady like tie her feet up in ties and yeah. rocks and stuff to, to yeah. get it. I know. I'll just date someone else. Yeah, you're like you know we'll just turn the light off. No, but yeah, okay. yeah. Everyone's the same uh, when they're in bed. You know. <laughs> hey, we'll we'll call that. That's the new. That's the name of this episode. Everyone's the same when they're in bed. No. That's not mine. Someone I, else said that. No, I, I know it's a cliche. I, I don't remember who. To know me but, is to love me. Episode two forty three. Right. <laughs> Just these cliches. <laughs> yeah. They, uh, yeah. E I, equals MC squared. Mike Black's theory. Of, <laughs> is theory there relativity. Really? Yeah. Hey, by the way, I got to tell you about these country bumpkin activities, man. We went to the. Yeah, you we went. To, yeah, baby. I was just laughing the whole time. I was going, "Oh my god, I can't wait to tell Mike about this." So, you know, my my uh, you know my affair with the fair. I love going to the fair. There's to me that's my comic con. I mean, I just love it. I love. Right. I don't know what it is. It's it's. I like it better than like any amusement park, and I just. It's uh, it's just great. Like what? While my wife and son are out doing the rides, I'm like, you know what? Let me go check out these exhibit halls. And I have found the nooks and crannies of where to go at a fair if you really want to get away from the crowds, which sounds hilarious. Like, aren't you the party starter? Yeah, I'm the party starter. I like to get away from the crowds and have some peace and quiet. So yeah. So this time I found uh, the couple of uh, quiet spots. If you want to go, um, if you go to the the Orange County Fair. Uh, like you could go to the hall. I think it's called the Veteran Hall of Fame or something, or the the Veterans Hall. But that's like this. It's off in the distance. It's off in the corner, and it's um, it's a great place if you if you want to just get some peace and quiet and kind of look at the history of uh you know of our military. And also, little side note, nobody ever uses the restrooms there, so. You can have a restroom all to yourself at the fair. Oh, thank God! <laughs> another, another. Did you, did you find that being in a, a big crowd in Comic Con? Like, where am I going to use a restroom where there's like some peace and quiet, or or is it no problem? Well, luckily they have a lot of facilities at the San Diego Convention Center. The thing you have to factor in is don't go at the last minute. Kind of plan ahead, and I guess that's anywhere with a big crowd, but plan for some cleanup time because whoever went in front of you didn't care you know they just wrecked the bathroom i think that's just part of being a man you have to be ready for that yeah yeah man there was a couple of uh restroom uh situations uh out there like like restroom facilities and uh i would say this is more of a plus but at the time i thought it was kind of a minus is uh, the bathroom attendants were actually in there the entire time you're in there. So in one hand, you're like, oh, I kind of wanted to be alone in here. But in the second hand, you're like, well, you know what? This guy, like, he waits for everyone to come out. And as soon as they start washing their hands, he's in there, like, cleaning and making sure everything's stocked. And so all the bathrooms that I used were immaculate, I will say, that at, oh, okay. at the Orange well, County Fair. So, I mean, that it was they were immaculate. Well, that's nice. Yeah, uh, yeah, you'd write home about it. You know, I never really thought about that. I always hated men's room attendants yeah. being in there because it's like you, you you do you really want privacy right. when when you're doing stuff. But um, then afterwards, it's like I, I don't want to tip someone just to go to the bathroom. Yeah. But well, I don't want to yeah. not tip them either. Well, this was good because they were hired by the LA County Fair, so they had like their gloves, their mask, and they were like doing their own thing. Like they weren't. It wasn't like a guy with a bucket and candy trying to get money out. Of you. <laughs> a bunch of mints and stuff. Yeah. yeah. You like cologne, dude? I'm looking at sheep over here. I'm in the livestock section. I could. I, I'm not wearing. Because I always cologne. get in this weird conundrum of, uh, all right, I'm giving him a dollar, but I'm taking a dollar's worth of candy. <laughs> exactly. To even it out, and it's a weird situation to be in. Yeah, you're walking out with Tootsie Rolls and smelling like Dracar Noir. Right. <laughs> like they, and just, then, uh, like, you also think, well, he's got to sit in there all day, gosh. no matter how bad it gets. I know. So maybe I should just leave the dollar and just not take anything, you know. I, I You know, it's funny you said that. I did, the only place I didn't mind was uh, at that place called Dublin's on Sunset, where they did comedy in the early 2000s. The bathroom uh-huh. attendant there was a younger dude. He was probably about 30. And... Uh, he because he was there every Tuesday. You, he was kind of part of the comedy scene. Like he would, you know, yeah. he'd pump you up before your set, or if you didn't have a good set, he'd 
he you know he'd still lift your spirit like it was more like that like he was like a, he was like yeah, a, see, at a place like that or at like a fancy restaurant anywhere where you're on a date yeah i think it's a i think it's great to have a guy like that who's kind of like your butler right for, for five minutes or whatever like you get to be on a but at the first county date, fair yeah. oh yeah screw that yeah come on what are you doing <clears throat> i know and it's uh and, or a bowling alley. Have you ever had one at a oh bowling gosh. alley? Where it's like, yeah. Give me a break. I know. No, I got to say the Orange County Fair uh, facilities are much better than the LA County Fair. LA County Fair, look, I think a lot of them were built in the 40s. And yeah, that's the one where I took those videos of like the the sink, the pipe is only about two inches long, and as you're washing your hands, your knuckles bump up against the screen. <laughs> you know, but this this one was great. Like I found my little nooks and crannies. Of privacy. Here's another great thing I found. And this is actually fascinating. Maybe this happens after you hit a certain age. I actually was loving the exhibit of the honeybees. There were some bees, and they were all in this glass case. And there was thousands of them there. I think he said there was about, because he had people guessing, you know, like you would jelly beans. Like, how many jelly beans are in the jar? He was like, how many, how many bees do you think are in there? And people were like, I don't know, a thousand? Turns out it was between ten and 15,000 bees. And he said, can you find the queen bee? She has a yellow dot on her back. Well, wait. Uh, oh, okay. So is that the only difference? Well, yes, because they, they, there's only one queen bee in there, and they, they, uh, they put the yellow dot on there, and it lasts for about two or three years. And eventually, he, he just pointed. He showed me where it was at. So it was really cool to like follow the queen bee, and I got a video. I haven't put it up yet of, uh, to make a little quick little vlog of it. But, well, people will be scintillated. Uh, <laughs> they're they're going to, they're surrounding this bee. I mean, they're, I go, what are they doing? Because it looked like she was milking, you know, like, like it was like the mama cat that, that's, like, you know, giving, you, you might want to call uh, Meta, uh, yeah, contact yeah. them ahead of time <laughs> and say, look, there's going to be kind of a, a rush on the internet when I drop this video. <laughs> you might want to have all your servers set up and firing because uh, it's really panic is about to hit the internet when they people see this video when they find the queen bee and her servants and i got it all on footage buddy <laughs> <laughs> they don't got to go to the orange county fair and find the bee with the yellow dot i found it for them in fact as soon as we're done i'm calling tmz <laughs> darren carter owns the footage <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. well well, yeah, they looked like she was milking them or something, or they were being like she was feeding them. Like they were all, they were, but and they were all surrounding her, and they were like, and I go, what is that? And he said that the the drone bees and all the bees in there, they're grooming her. They're making sure she's clean. They're making sure that she's just like taken care of, like basically, <laughs> like they, they do the actual queen. Yeah, it's like their glam squad or something like they're, you know, it was it was. Um, but anyways, and needless to say, that wasn't a very popular area of the fair. <laughs> like, like <laughs> really. It was just me and this beekeeper, <laughs> and then like a few other people would come up and, and stuff, and you know. But uh, you I know, like that you said at a certain age you you started finding stuff like that interesting. Like I don't think I found that interesting in my twenties. Like in my twenties, I was probably at the at still at the midway area, looking at all the rides and you know the, you know what I mean, like the different probably like, ladies. Yeah, so I was gonna say, you know what I mean, like you're you're in that area where all the like the hot girls are and they're showing their skin. But now at this age, I'm like, yeah, you know. I'm Go check out these bees. You know? <laughs> I'm gonna ask questions. I'm gonna just watch one hot girl get taken care of by 50, 50 dudes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that, that actually sounds kind of creepy, but you know, that's yeah. that's what I was doing, though. You that's know? basically it. Yeah. So then I went to the. Uh, I like to think that she was telling them all gossip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's like, look at this freak looking at us, filming us. What the hell is going going on here? But they um, and then at one point there was a concert you, that was. You know who B one thousand four hundred and fifty six is hooking up with, don't you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> I know. They uh, I and then I I looked over. Um, there was a hill, and where the hill is, there was like an amphitheater, and there was a concert you had to you know pay to go see. It was like some eighties rock groups or whatever, and. Uh, <laughs> And so I was really surprised. I look up, and there was a bunch of goats and a llama and a little donkey, and they were running around up there. And apparently, they were hired by somebody, and their their job solely is to graze and 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 graze and make oh, grass wow. go. Down. Yeah, that was really cool to ne see like them do that, like a natural way of doing lawn care. Well, that's that's interesting. 
Yeah, that was pretty- you know, I wonder if they had goats there uh, partially because of their uh, popularity in Thor Love and Thunder, which just came out. Hmm. I don't. Two, yeah, Thor has two goats in the movie, and they have a very prominent role in the film, and people really liked them. They, wow. Like, they're so, like, now they're, like, making stuffed animals of them and T-shirts and stuff. Oh, cool. And in fact, at Comic-Con, the first night I was there, uh, there was a uh, party that Stephen Kramer Glickman hosted uh, that was a Thor Love and Thunder party. And at the party, they had two live goats. So there was a little bit of overlap between uh, both of our events. (laughs) Wow. And then I just saw that Chris Rock, Dave Chappelle... And Kevin Hart were on stage, Madison Square Garden, and Kevin Hart brought out a goat to give to Chris Rock. Did you see that? No. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was Dave Chappelle, but I think he gave it to Chris Rock, and and it's goat standing for greatest of all time. Yes. And they were like, what are you going to call it? And I think Dave Chappelle said, uh, Will Smith, (laughs) or something (laughs) like that. And Yeah, that was kind of funny. But yeah, so so goats are making a comeback in the media these days. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Yeah. So, anyways, I'm over there looking at that, and then I get this. My my phone starts blowing up. I'm like, "What is going on?" And my wife was like, "You got to come over here by the cantina. That you're not going to believe it. There's a monster truck show that's about to start." (laughs) And I'm like, "I'd never been to. I think I went to one when I was a kid. I went to like a tractor pull. Maybe it was a monster truck show. Have you ever? That's another country bumpkin activity. Have you ever been to a monster truck show? No, I have not." Tell me about it. <laughs> you better buckle up, buddy, because we're no, we're gonna <laughs> dive deep. You, no, because here's the thing, <laughs> dude. You would get a kick out of this. So you had to have tickets to get because you're already in the fair, but it's like an additional entry. You have to have tickets to observe the monster truck show. However, if you could picture a football game, all the people that with the pay tickets are on the 50-yard line and like that area, they're, they're looking at it from side to side. But if you're in the end zone, basically where the trucks would continue to go, that's where the free, the free tickets were. So oh, okay. they did have some cheap seats, like the free seats, but they kept that a limited amount. And it was basically at the, the, uh, the finish line where there was like a lot of danger and, and sad. Like, like if, the, if, right. the, if the brakes failed, those monster trucks might just go right up into the stands. Yeah, people, you can't sue if it's free. <laughs> exactly. But I, we, we actually got in there. Finally, we finally got in because enough people had to leave. And we finally got in there. I, and I was cracking jokes, but it's funny. The monster truck crowd probably wasn't, they didn't really want to hear jokes. Like, yeah. Like the security guard was was making everyone wait outside the gate. So we're all kind of waiting, but we're hearing the, and then you're hearing the noise and all the dust is flying. The crowd's going, yeah. And you could see a little bit of the trucks like, Jumping up a hill, flying in the air and landing. I mean, it looked really exciting. And did you ever see the movie Idiocracy? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, this... Loved it. We just recently seen it, so we're like, dude, this is like Idiocracy. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> like, not only is it monster trucks, but like the free tickets are right by the finish line where the trucks could run up the stand. And I... Tonight's, <laughs> tonight's trial promises to be even more better. <laughs> yeah. This is one, one of my favorite lines of that movie. My wife and I were laughing because we were like, dude, you never saw so many baby strollers. Like, there's a place where the baby strollers were supposed to, you're supposed to leave it there while you're watching the monster truck show. And the place, it was just piled with mon- with uh, baby strollers. Yeah. And I was like, idiocracy. Like, like I bet yeah. you outside of like a fine art gallery, you probably wouldn't see that many baby strollers compared to like a monster truck <laughs> show. You know what I mean? Like, there's hey. common ground still, I guess. Get it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a lot of... I mean, now, were any of these celebrity monster trucks there? Like Graveyard or whoever? I didn't... Uh, Grave, Grave Digger. Digger. Grave Digger, yeah. They now, might the, They might have been... The one I, from our generation was, of course... You know... Do you, you, do you remember? I don't remember. Do I mean, you remember it, the, the name of was the, it, the big one? Was it... The a, light. Was it Bigfoot or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, that was our generation's big... That was like... It may not have been the first monster truck, but it was by far the most famous. Oh, yeah. Let me see. I'll Google it right now. Oh, yeah. Bigfoot versus USA 1, the birth of monster truck madness. (laughs) (laughs) 
You know, it's one of those things I'd heard about, just like maybe people have heard of wrestling, but they've never experienced a live show. I think I could see the appeal of the monster trucks because I think the most eighties thing that could have happened would have been if Hulk Hogan drove Bigfoot across country <laughs> over Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> like jumped the Grand Canyon and landed on Dolph Lundgren and then waved the, the U.S. flag and then did a, <laughs> a fist bump with Mr. T. Oh, that's funny. That would have been the most 80s thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, that Monster Truck stuff, it was really fun, though, Like just to see a little bit of it, like, the, the little so we finally get in you know there was a tribute band that was playing up the way and we're like let's go check out the tribute band no offense if you're a fan of this band but it just wasn't that appealing to me and the band was called oingo boingo oh i'm a big big oingo boingo fan oh uh, my gosh are you really i saw danny elfman live uh this last halloween for uh the live nightmare before christmas that they do oh yeah see now now danny elfman probably plays different music than oingo boingo right uh well he he wrote and composed all the music for oingo boingo but he's done uh just a ton of movie soundtracks like with oingo boingo i think all i know is it's a dead man's party that's yeah I, that's their most famous that's all I, and that's they did that one and i was like eh. And there was one more, and I was like, "This isn't really my thing," you know. Yeah. But maybe, but I, but Danny Elfman probably has a lot of songs I would recognize from various movies. And your thing is watching bees. Yeah, exactly. You know what? And you're right. So we I, I don't think anyone's going to be upset. Yeah. That, that even Danny Elfman, that he's not your cup of tea. Yeah. See, you know, you know, oh yeah. So we watched about a one and a half song. By the way, it was a tribute band. So it wasn't like it was really right. Oingo yeah. Boingo. And it wasn't Danny Elfman. So, you know. Right. So. Did the guy sing? Because he, he really has a tremendous voice. I don't know. We watched about one and a half songs. And we're like, hey, let's go see if more people have been let out of the Monster Truck show. So then we, <laughs> so then we went back. And dude, we got free seats. They finally let us in. And as we're waking, making our way up the stands and the crowd's going, yay. Ooh, cheering we sit down we found great seats and then the noise was like Neh! like that and my wife was like oh gosh oh dear you know so she reaches in her purse and she's grabbing some like kleenex tissues to put in like like my son's ears and i'm thinking well it's only like 10 seconds when the engines it's not like a concert so by the right. time he puts he gets kleenexes to put in his ears the show's over and they're like folks that was it the monster truck show and we're like oh man so so then we left the monster truck pump, bumpkin activities in the. So nobody caught fire or anything. Or? No, nothing crazy. I felt pretty safe though from the because Did they have that big robot monster truck that eats other trucks. Dude, I didn't. I don't. They might have. I don't. We didn't get to see. All, all I saw was after each monster truck would perform and race around the thing and jump up and crush cars or whatever. Then they would park right in front of where we were at. So I felt like we were protected because there was a bumper of, <laughs> of you know, they'd have to... Of hit. monster trucks that they don't want damaged. Exactly. Yeah. The, the, the losers I went before. So so after that, then we went over and we found like a, um, uh, like a, uh, like a, what do you call it? Like a South Pacific band that was doing like, you know, they would bring out... Um, Hula they would just dancers. Play songs from South Pacific. Yes, yeah. Like they, they would, you know, it was like three or four guys up there with their drums, steel drums, and then they would do like the women of Hawaii, and the ladies would come out with their grass oh, skirts, yeah. you know, and and I the steel drum sort of music. Yes, yes, the steel drum. So they would do Hawaii, and now we'll take you to New Zealand, and then the guys did the. Is it called the Hayaka or the Hayawaka or the that thing that. It looks like a scary dance where they're, they're like the rugby players do, where they're like, -la 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 -la. oh, the, the, the haka, I think. Yeah, the haka. Yeah, that thing. They they did that, and they, they grin, and they stick their tongues out, and they scare the audience. And then one of them jumped off stage. like He looked like The Rock, and he kind of like scares somebody, then he smiles real big. and like That was fun. Like They would go back and forth between like a female from Hawaii, and then the male, and then the women would come out and, and with different costumes. and That was actually pretty fun. So it was a lot of international music. Yeah, but mainly those islands, like you know, like the, Man, Hawaii, look, New Zealand. You know who Asia, really loves Samoa. island music the most and uses it a lot? Uh, Danny Elfman. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm. I'm really not kidding about that. Wow. Uh, uh, 
I would like to hear a Danny Elfman. Danny Elfman has a lot of that. A tribute band, Hawaiian music style of yeah. They, if um, those two bands had joined forces, they'd be <laughs> unstoppable. Yeah, yeah, they were good, man. And then, like I said, I walked through another. And if, listen, here's another hot tip: if you ever find yourself at a fair and the stimulus is just too much, too many people screaming on roller coasters, too much crazy music, too much any of that stuff, you go find an exhibit hall where they. They prominently display Needlepoint. That's another place that I found is very, <laughs> very quiet in the Needlepoint exhibit hall. <laughs> yeah. Well, they need to concentrate in there. Yeah, they do. Yeah, that was cool. I I, I like those country bumpkin activities though. That was pretty fun, you know. Um, uh, it sounds like for you it would be. I got a question for you. You know, on the previous episode, you guys go check that out. Episode two forty two. A lot of people. Gave us some great compliments on that. Some of the topics we talked about were seafood and food that Mike Black is, you know, not into. And also, we talked about right. worst comedy gigs. And I was thinking on this one, let's go down memory lane and think of some of our better comedy gigs, like the best comedy gig, because that's something that I think needs to be celebrated. And maybe, maybe we don't think of all the time, you know, maybe because you just go from gig to gig, and the next thing you know, you're like. You know, three years pass by, four years pass by, but sometimes I think it's good to take note of some of those great gigs. Like, oh yeah, um, yeah. Um, um, I can start, or you can start. Yeah, uh, you know, just about any time at the Comedy and Magic Club was fun. Uh, but there was a night that it was the the worst in a way and the best in a way because. Mm. For, uh, like, imagine being me, young comic, just started working with uh, John Panette, and he invites me to come uh, open for him at the Comedy and Magic Club, which is a club any comic would be thrilled to, to get into. Oh, yeah, it's in Hermosa Beach. Um, Seinfeld <laughs> goes there. Carlin would go there. Gary Schilling. Yeah, Leno, Leno goes there people, on Sundays. You know. It's... Yeah, and uh, and so we're already there in the green room, and I think it's just the two of us on the show. Well, uh, Larry Miller comes in to do a guest spot. Great. Hmm. Roseanne comes in to do a guest spot. Oh, I I get up to shake her hand. She goes, "I don't shake hands in junk," and I was like, "Cool." <laughs> What'd you say? I don't shake hands. What? And junk. Oh, I don't shake hands and junk. Yeah, and oh. I was like, that's cool. And uh, just kind of went back to what Dude, I Dude, I don't doing. ever want to be like that. I get it. I don't want to be like that. And I probably have it's, been like that, especially with COVID, you know? like. But I've been trying to shake hands more. Like, if someone wants to shake my hand, I do it. I'm the opposite of that. I like to mush my hands on someone's face when I'm... <laughs> just really get in there. Just, you know. Yeah. But you know uh, what I mean? Like, I, I there's a lot of that that goes on, and... And I've done it by accident sometimes, and I've done it on purpose. But when I've done it by accident, maybe I just wash my hands and they're still wet because I hate using those air dryers. Yeah. Like, I'll usually tell someone that that's what's going on, though, if, if that's the case. Yeah. Or if I have a phobia or whatever. But, yeah, uh, you know, whatever. It, it I didn't really take that much offense to it because I was like, I by that time in my life, I'd met a lot of comics. Yeah. And a lot of them are like that. You yes, know? exactly. And, and so I was like, yeah, that's fine. But um, then I mean, uh, imagine like meeting Elvis Presley and he said that, or meeting Frank Sinatra and he said that. It's like that's why I'm saying like I, I don't know. I get it though. I get it. Yeah, but I kind of don't want to be like that. Well, then don't be like that. Oh, <laughs> you know, okay, <laughs> that's all there is to it. You know? well, I'm basically talking to myself because I know I have been like that, and I don't want to be like that anymore. Well, stop it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> stop being like that. <laughs> You know what? Maybe Very easy. maybe I, maybe I, I'll uh, I'll be like I am now, and then if I, hopefully or whatever, if I ever get to that, look, Elvis. I'm Presley. trying to tell you a story. I'm sorry. Okay, okay, okay. okay change yeah. spiral. Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> get you into therapy or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. So <laughs> I, I didn't mean to trigger you this hard yeah. about yeah. fucking handshakes, Jesus. But uh, yeah. so anyway, so then yeah. Michael Richards comes in. And Kramer he, from he, Seinfeld, I believe. Yeah, he wants to do some time too. Now this is a week before his meltdown, 
Now, Larry Miller goes up. Everyone, the, the understanding is that everyone will do five. And I'm introducing each of them. And for me, this is great. I'm introducing these legends, uh, you know. Oh, yeah. And, uh, I, I already had done my spot, so the pressure's off. Uh, you know, Larry Miller, I, I love. And so I was like, oh, this is great. Roseanne goes up. I thought, now, if anyone on that group is going to run the light, it's going to be her. Like she's earned the right to do it at that point, you know. Yeah, she does five minutes and just annihilates the room, just crushes. Panette is so excited; he's like, "This is going to be awesome," because the crowd's in such a great mood. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> then I, I bring up Michael Richards, who does about forty minutes of the unfunniest unfunny I've ever seen. I know. Just and the audience there is so great in that area. Uh, in Hermosa Beach, they're so supportive of comedy that they just endured it for yeah. 40 minutes. For him, I remember they would get pretty happy to see him for the first five minutes, seven minutes, right. eight minutes. Like, oh my gosh, it's Kramer! You know, and you're right, as the yeah. time goes by, it's kind of like, okay. and he didn't, he didn't come anywhere close to the meltdown that he had. But he uh, he came backstage after I brought Panette up, and Panette, of course, was fuming by that point. But yeah, he he went out and killed and gave them a, a great show to end on. But uh, Richards comes backstage and he's like, "Yeah, I just couldn't find a way to close, buddy. I'm sorry. Uh, did did I go over? Mm. Ooh, only about thirty five minutes <laughs> over. Dude, you know? it was like no. I hate. I I'll tell you." Any comic that is worth a damn will tell you this. If you can't find a, a way to close that's strong, after two minutes, just get off stage. That's a good idea. You're not yeah. helping anybody. You're just wrecking it further for everybody else. Yeah, you know, I've, I've seen a couple comics do that recently where they just almost end abruptly. Like and I don't even yeah. remember if they're closing line and they don't say their name and they didn't say that's my time they would say something else like and that's all I have to say about that good night or and, yeah. or they'd say like you know some kind of weird like thing where I'm like oh that it gets the job done you know M my that, favorite is when someone just kind of acknowledges that they're bombing because usually that'll get a laugh at least mm. and then just get off uh, or or just you know. Uh, <laughs> If you liked me, I'm Ari Shafir or whatever. You know, yeah, so make like, up some other name like uh, like yeah, sometimes they throw out someone else's name just to make fun of them. You know, yeah, Fraser Smith will throw out like another like the the weather man here in L.A. He'll put his name out there. He'll yeah. be like, he'll be like, hey, I got to get out of here and give this coat back to Dallas Rains. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah, so, or whatever, so, something like that. It's always better to do that than to think you're gonna get this heroic last joke in. It's like. None of the other stuff you, you tried worked. You're just not connecting with this crowd. Yeah. Let it go. <laughs> yeah, that's a weird feeling when you're not co connecting with a crowd, and it's just it could be strange. And then you just you, the only you time know. I think that's a that's not the right thing to do is if you're the headliner. Yeah, I think if you're the headliner and you're closing the show out, you have a duty to try every trick in your bag. But if you're out of tricks, just let people go home <laughs> you know. know it's weird when you're bombing in front of a group of people like your material starts to shrink it's almost like you're putting spinach on the on the grill and it's just shriveling it up like like to nothing i mean yeah because each joke you you give less time to for for them to sit with yeah because you feel like they're not giving you any time to you know they're not and then you're uh, in your head. You're like, what are they thinking? I remember the uh, a gig. <laughs> it's funny. I started this out like, let's talk about joke or like our best shows ever. Now we're thinking about bombing again. <laughs> but but I remember I did a I, someone p hired me to perform at a architect uh, award ceremony for these architects, and they were like, this is so and so. He's the he's the rock star of architecture, <laughs> and you know, and it was in it was in uh, like the Pacific Design Center building, I think off Melrose. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, everybody was wearing like tuxedos, and they were chatting and drinking wine and eating cheese. And then I was at a podium, and the the event planners were all <clears throat> they had like they were wearing black, looking like Steve Jobs, and they had headphones like you know 
Garth Brooks or something, and they were like, "You're on in two. You're on in two. I mean, it was just so. And then I go, I'm like, on in two. Can we can we tell the crowd like, comedy will begin in five minutes. Please take a seat. Can we do? And they're like, it's not on the it's not in the script. And they, there's so when it was me, my time to go out there, I'm on some podium with some weird microphone, and people are still chatting and milling around and. It was very difficult, buddy. I'll tell you that much. It was very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> it was like <clears throat> the rock star of architecture. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, Did he build anything that you knew about? You, you know what? I, that would have been a good question to ask. <laughs> I didn't even. <laughs> I was so like, there were, everything was just coming at me with a million questions. And where do you want to stand? And where do you, and you know, your script will be here, your blah, blah, blah. And, and I was just like, ah, uh, okay. And, you know, yeah, that would have been a great question. I would have done that now. At that time, I was just like, let's just get through. I'll do my, because I was only supposed to do like 15 minutes, which sounds easy, right? 15 minutes. You know, if he had created like all of Dio's like stage shows or something like that, that would be something. Right. You know, know. I, you know. <laughs> like you know that that building shaped like a skull downtown <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> wow rock star of architecture that building you know, rules <laughs> i know all i could think of was like you know mike brady you know like from the brady Bunch. right yeah he's like that but a rock star boring i think i'll just do my own act no. <laughs> that's basically the partridge family <laughs> no exactly the, yeah but i was thinking okay there's two what would you rather hear? Uh, the first time I did national TV or the first time I did the Tonight Show? Tonight Show. Everyone loves stories about the Tonight Show. Okay, so that was my okay. My first time doing the Tonight Show. They had seen me by accident, the, the talent bookers. They happened to be at the Ice House in Pasadena, and they were there to scout the headliner. And the headliner, you know, his energy was a lot different than mine. Like, it was more, like, low energy. And I just happened to be on the show with him. And I went out, you know, guns a blazing, you know, 20 minutes, whatever I was supposed to do. Can you say the headliner's name or do you not want to? Um, I'll tell you was off it, the air, but. Was it Stephen Wright? No, but <laughs> it, was, it was it was a guy like that, but not not as famous. Um, Emo Phillips? No, it was a, it was a guy. <laughs> He's but a I, very I, funny yeah. guy. It was just, I, I basically, I got let off the show after that. The. Um, I remember the club owner called me and was like, yeah, it was just a miss. It was our problem with the booking. We should not have. But I'm thinking, dude, that was great because I got introduced to the Tonight Show people. So that was a great yeah. mistake, quote unquote. So um, they they said they asked me, they go, would you be interested in doing the Tonight Show? And I'm like, yes, I would. And of course, like, duh. Yeah. And I remember I had taped my show that night on a tape recorder. And as I'm leaving passing, I come back to Burbank. I get off the exit. And at that time, the NBC studios were right there in Burbank. And I couldn't believe it. I was on cloud nine that whole way. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So I remember hitting, I remember parking my car and looking at the NBC studios and the NBC logo and hitting play on my set so I could totally in, you know, vision, I can envision what it would be like for me to be telling those jokes on, the, on NBC television. And oh, wow. uh, it was a great, it was a goosebump moment because it was, Probably, I felt like there's a good chance this could happen, and it did happen. I will tell you this: it took me about a year after that to get on the Tonight Show because they're backed up with guests and they want you to run that set and they they fiddle with your set where they go, "Why do you instead of saying this, can you say that? Can you maybe like eventually once you do a lot of late night spots, maybe they don't do it as much." But it was my first yeah. time doing national. Uh, something like that so they were really particular like say this, this well and this. back back yeah. then there were a lot more standards and practices were a lot more hardcore <laughs> i think yeah and i will say this it was a great tonight show set if you guys go to my youtube channel type in darren carter tonight show you'll see it and uh you'll see what i'm talking about but it was great though I, it, now did uh in the green room did ed mcmahon come back and uh, <laughs> like yeah check on you? Uh, that is wild uh hey darren uh, it went so well johnny asked me if you want you want to play tennis no um it was, <laughs> it was with jay leno and jay leno and the, no but jay leno himself came to the green room he was backstage and uh i did by the way the other guests were lele sobieski and michael kane oh wow uh, that's and, a good lineup. Yeah, it was a good lineup. And Jay Leno came in like he'd be like your funny uncle or something. He's like he opens up his wallet and pretends to pay me some money. He's like, okay, I'm gonna be too funny tonight, you know, <laughs> or something like. It was just so cool. And uh, at that time, I'd already been on that stage because they were filming another show called Friday Night Videos, 
And uh, oh yeah, I remember that. Show. Yeah, for some of our younger vis- younger listeners who don't have who didn't have cable back then, uh, I understand a lot of people would watch on Friday night. They would show music videos, so people would watch that, and then they'd play comedians in between music videos. So. I'd been I think that was the, the only competition for Party Machine with Nia people. <laughs> right. So so I'd been on that, that stage, and, and at that time, when they would film that, there was less people, I don't know, 120 people each taping or whatever it was. So I'd been on the stage, but to the side of it. They only used part of the stage, and then they used a smaller crowd. When you did the actual Tonight Show, the whole audience was filled up, and, it was, uh, and then you're in the center of the stage and everything is just, the energy is way different. I mean, it's the tonight show. So it was like, wow. And, um, I remember they asked me if I wanted a car. Do you need a car? Do you need a car service to pick you up? Blah, blah, blah. And, uh, at that time we'd only been living, we lived in Burbank and about a mile from NBC. So, uh, I was like, yeah, I don't really need a town car. I mean, we're like, come on, you know, <laughs> you know it's like, plus at that time, I think we were living in a small apartment. So I didn't want that Cinderella moment of like, you know, national TV, limousine, and then midnight, psh, okay, get back to your little hot box in the valley. You know, <laughs> right. Like, you know, so I was like, eh, eh, I'll be humble. and We know. have to find the owner of this glass flashlight. <laughs> exactly. You know, and this, are you the flashlight? Are you the party starter? Yeah. And, uh, and I remember at that time, we lived on a busy street in uh, one of the main streets in Burbank. And the very next day, I went to take the garbage out at the apartment complex like area, the dumpster. And at the stoplight, I, I kid you not, who do I see? Jay Leno. I saw Jay Leno. Uh-huh. And it was so, I didn't want to, it was so weird, dude. I felt like Cinderella, like, oh, there's Jay Leno. He's going on with his daily life of luxury and fame. And here oh, I am right. back in my normal life too, just taking the garbage out. Like it was, <laughs> it was weird, dude. It was weird. Did you wave at him? No, I didn't want him to see me. I was like, it'd be embarrassing almost. Like, hey, I did your show yesterday. You know, like, that'd be so weird. Like. It'd be like, well, is that your car? Exactly. <laughs> what a terrible car. <laughs> I know. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So I was, but that was, what was great about The Tonight Show? Well, number one, it's a credit, but the, the fun of it was great. I remember after you, you tape it in the in the uh, late afternoon and then they air it that night. So in between that time, you know, I remember um, my family, we went out to the uh, really that really nice restaurant by Warner Brothers called The Smokehouse. And the owner of the Ice House, Bob Fisher, uh, mm-hmm. that owner, like now I believe it's one of the, it's uh, somebody from the Lakers, J- Johnny Buss, I believe. He's, he's the new owner. But at that time it was Bob Fisher. So he came and he, you know, he had dinner with us. And it was, it was a really celebratory, like exciting night. It was a, a night of like, wow, I've worked all these years, all these crappy gigs. Finally, you know, the stars are aligned at this moment in time. Like it was a really cool cool thing for me you know that was a that was it was great it was great now i heard at the tonight show after you do your set you get to have all the ice cream you want oh maybe i don't remember that i remember maybe saving my appetite for the dinner afterwards no no i i got that mixed up with having your tonsils removed (laughs) yeah oh that's true (laughs) yeah it's uh that's yeah, after you have your tonsils removed, you can have all the ice cream you want. Yeah, that that was a great, great gig. Now let me think of a gig that was that wasn't televised. You know what I mean? Because there's still those great gigs. Because sometimes a great gig can be something where you're like, "Wow, tonight's the night I became a headliner," or "Tonight's the night I actually did 30 minutes without any lulls." Like, remember all those moments? Yeah, those are great moments yeah. too. Yeah, you know. And then and then I would say like even now just the simple nights like the nights that used to be routine you know where you're like at the store or the comedy or wherever you're performing and you're just seeing you know well a lot of nights it's it's a bad night that turns around like i i don't know if i told you about this but i put a little clip of it on my instagram but there was a night this month in july where the air conditioning at the comedy store died oh yeah and it's in the OR, it's an entirely black room in a black building. Heat builds up. And the crowd was just, they weren't a bad crowd. They were just exhausted. They were in a toaster oven, basically. Mm-hmm. And I was the last comic of the night, and they'd been that sort of crowd all night, more like a TED Talk crowd, they call it, you know, 
where they're just listening but not really giving anything back. And a, about 10 minutes into a 25-minute set, hmm. I broke them <laughs> and got them to, like, laugh and to forget about the heat and to start, like, engaging with me and with each other and stuff like that. That, to me, is as important as, like, oh, it was, you know, that was maybe a crowd of 30 people, but they all stayed, like, nobody left. That becomes its own sort of triumph, you know? Yeah. Like, I would rather have sets like that than, uh, you know, oh, I played for 15,000 people. Well, that's amazing, of course. Yeah. But that's kind of expected to go a certain way, it, you know? Uh, but like on a set where it seems like everything's stacked against you and it still goes well, those are the ones that I remember yes. the most. Yeah, it, yeah, like a new victory. Like I, I did a um, in December of 2019, I was hired to play a Christmas party, holiday, yeah. a holiday party for a big company, and that was that would have been something that would have made me nervous before, where I'm like, okay, I got to be clean. But I've been writing that kind of material for a while now, so. It wasn't, yeah. I, I wasn't nervous anymore. And I knew I would, you know, I knew I could entertain these crowds before and be funny, but it was always like, well. You're talking about like the old days when you were Darren Carter, the dick joke starter. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Darren Carter, uh, the first 15 years of comedy, maybe 20 years uh, of right, comedy, yeah. where it's like, well, I can do clean for about 13 minutes. <laughs> and then there's right, like, yeah. you know, and uh, so that was, the, it was, it, it, they, they, wanted me to do a half hour and then they said hey also can we pay you to do uh almost like a game show host type thing like call each table up and do a christmas exchange christmas present exchange and and that was something i'd never done and i was like oh yeah. that's fun yeah it was great and and at the end of it when when it was all said and done and i got my my uh my check and how great the good of a time it was there was no weirdness it wasn't like you know like when you do a gig and people kind of avert their eyes at you <laughs> like they, yeah like it was none of that it was like it, I well felt, there's yeah. a double pressure of everyone wants you to do well but there's a small group that really wants you to do well because their job might be kind of on the line yeah for suggesting you you know that, that and that was one of those moments where i was like wow i actually did this i this is maybe i could do this now i could do corporate gigs because it wasn't like this you know when you first start out in comedy, a lot of people were, were younger. So we're young when we start. And then we think of corporate gigs. We think of people that are about 20 years older than we are, 30 years older than we are. Right. And now now that I'm older, the audience is younger. Like like that corporate gig, there were like a lot of them were my age, younger, fewer older. But it wasn't like, you know, it, it was actually pretty easy. It wasn't like a All bunch right. of fuddy-duddies that you picture like an... Remember like an 80s movie? You'd watch like the boss of the company. Like you'd be like, how am I ever going to make... Oh, right. How am I going to make those people laugh? Like, you know, Yeah. Yeah. I have now, nothing to say to that guy. Yeah. Now you'd get on stage. If I took you to that corporate gig, by the way, you could have told... You, if I get it again, you, you, I'll, I'll, I'll love to have you open for me if, if I ever get to do it again. Um, sure. They, uh, you're going to laugh because you're going to be like, dude, this is easy crowd. This is like a comedy store audience. You know, this is... Yeah. Like, everyone was dressed casual. It was multi-ethnic it was great man it was very what we were used to doing it wasn't hard at all you know no big round tables it wasn't difficult it was, <laughs> right you know. yeah um i got another yeah thing. that makes a big difference yeah i got a i got another uh topic for you so okay this came out the other day uh, a silly little joke my son asked me about it he's like dad have you ever heard of those jokes like how many fill in the blank does it take to change a light bulb and I'm like, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. And I usually don't like those jokes. By the way, I've looked up. I'm get what I'm getting at is I looked some up, so I'm I'm getting ready to do that. <laughs> but uh, oh boy, I, oh boy, I know. And I'm like, well, I don't really. I usually just kind of gloss over those. I usually don't laugh at those. I don't really. But I looked into it, and apparently they they made a big. They kind of came out in the '60s, you know. Like I don't know. What, uh, they've been around longer than that. Oh, they you were think so? like, yeah. yeah. Armed forces jokes and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. The, uh, basically, like uh, stereotype sort of jokes. Uh, yeah. In fact, you can find old books uh, like Blanche Knott was uh, one author in particular uh, of a series called Truly Tasteless Jokes. Oh, I still love those books. That's that's basically what these those jokes are, and uh, and they would even break them down by stereotype. You know, it was a 
like we're saying all the time now, it was a different time. But uh, there were a ton of them. There was, uh, I remember vividly, there was a chapter just called Helen Keller Jokes. Oh, yeah, exactly. You know, well, and so it, it was a thing. It's been around for forever. Well, yeah. according to Wikipedia, because I looked up light bulb jokes, it said, um, it said the uh, light bulb joke, uh, maybe it became popular. So it became popular in the late 60s and the 70s. And you're right. They were usually used to insult the intelligence of people, especially like Polish people or, you know, the, for example, right. and this is going, guys, I'm going off Wikipedia. How many Polacks does it take to change a light bulb? Three, one to hold the light bulb and two to turn the ladder. So those, yeah. those kind of jokes, like those were the, um, so anyways, I, it's funny. I, I, I remember thinking those jokes are kind of corny and I wasn't really into it. Cause I, here's the one that I hate. Cause you'd always hear, I, I still see this one pop up. How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? How many? Uh, one, but the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> yeah. Like that's the one I'm like, oh gosh, I just. It's like the safest version of one. Right. But yeah, they're all jokes that like kids would tell in third grade and no one really knew like any actual differences between a Polish kid and another kid. You right. Know? Right. I and remember so the first time I met a man, yeah. we were, once again, we were at a fair. We were at the Fresno Fair, the big Fresno Fair. And there was a man selling organs and pianos. And I remember he gave his business card to my dad. And my dad looked at the last name and he goes, oh, you're Polish. And the guy goes, yep, I'm a Polak. And I yeah. and I was thinking like, wow, I'm a Polak. I'm thinking, I didn't even know that was a person. I just thought it was a, a joke book. I did not know. <laughs> you, I had no idea. You didn't know these jokes were about actual people? No, I thought it was like, you know, like make-believe character like it, you know it's kind of funny the first time i saw like a collection of polish jokes was our polish neighbor across the street brought them over and she thought they were hilarious and she <laughs> just wanted to share them with right. my mom yeah and my mom loves to laugh at stuff and so they were just reading them back and forth now That's half funny. of them went over my head but the other half, I was like, wow, the Polish people must be pretty dumb. <laughs> They're writing all yeah. these jokes about them. You know, but, uh, you know, it was just, uh, again, I think a lot of stuff comes down to intent. And I think most of them are pretty, like, soft ribbing sort of jokes. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and they would uh, usually, the best ones would incorporate like one group and another group that had some sort of animosity and it would get them both laughing. Like, uh, buddy Hackett, uh, used to tell one about the Polish football team and the Italian football team. Uh, and I think I told it on the last show, but edited it, you know, but it was, uh, the, the whole joke was, uh, the halftime, uh, whistle blows. Uh, the Polish team thinks the game's over. They get on the bus and go home. <laughs> Two plays later, the Italian team scores. <laughs> <laughs> Two plays later, which is hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's it, it, they're, like they're not really. They were never really meant to reinforce real stereotypes or anything like that. And there are jokes definitely that are, and that go way overboard. But usually, I. Even as a little kid in the like late seventies, early eighties, I don't remember hearing a whole lot of those. Like there would be like maybe, you know, someone's you'd go to some kid's house to play and their drunk uncle would come out and have like some really terrible racist joke or something, and he'd be like, I'm six, right. so I'm gonna go away. <laughs> here's, <laughs> Let a, you here's a couple finish off your beer. By the way, if you guys are watching this or listening to this on YouTube, go to the comment section on YouTube and leave your favorite light bulb joke. And we'll read it <laughs> on a future episode. Uh, here we go. Here's one that I, that I read recently. I'm, I'm memorizing it, so hopefully, hopefully I don't mess it up. How many mystery writers does it take to change a light bulb? How many? Two. One to do about 99% of it and one to step in at the very end and do a surprise twist. <laughs> so stupid how many jazz musicians does it take to replace a light bulb how many a one a two a one two three four <laughs> <laughs> these are so dumb um, 
How many, uh, I think I have like one more left. Uh, oh, how many chiropractors does it take to change a light bulb? How many? One, but it takes six visits. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's about it on that. But um, do you have any, do you, maybe not, maybe you don't have any in your back pocket. No, I don't. I never would have had any. My if I didn't look this stuff up, I like I said. I kind of, I had them in my back pocket when I was a kid, but I kind of emptied out that pocket. After <laughs> exactly. A while. Yeah, the pocket party. Speaking of pockets, if you want to bless the pockets, hit that Venmo at Darren Carter Comic. Also on the Cash App, dollar sign Darren Carter Comic. Make sure you give Mike Black a follow on all his social media and. Um, Mike, have you uh, any any words of wisdom you'd like to leave with us? Anything that you've learned along the way in life, or even in the more recent times? Uh, it's really important to hydrate. It really is. Did you hydrate down at the convention? No, I didn't, and now I'm paying the price for it. I, ha- I, have you eaten bananas? They say bananas will get rid of the cramping. I well, I don't have any cramping. Thing uh, that might be next. Oh but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna eat a banana as soon as I get off here. Yeah, get, yeah. Seriously, man. Like I had a I had a cramp after the fair, and I was like, because I didn't. I even though we thought we drank a lot of water, you, I, I did not drink enough water. I should have drank even more water than I thought I did. You know. Yeah. So I remember eating bananas and water, and it seemed like it's doing okay. But I'm also uh, I don't want to keep bringing my age up again, but I'm also at an age where I really am stretching in the mornings. I'm stretching because I'm 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 not. Yeah. You know I. Yeah, we're not 20 anymore. Like, I feel like I, I do that at night too, uh, because I don't want to get like a Charlie horse. I used to get those real bad. Yeah, they used to be. I remember one time when I was at the YMCA as a kid, this uh, there's a martial artist, this black dude that was stretching, and he told me, He goes, Hey, kid, let me give you some advice stretch 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night before bed. And I never did it for like 30 years. <laughs> but in more recent <laughs> times, I'm like, You know, I always go back to that guy with his great advice, you know. <laughs> It really is, yeah. It really is. It's like, you know, everything goes back to stretching. Like I was watching these sprinters, and they they were like, if you want to learn, if you want to be faster, you need to be more flexible and have your mobility and stretch. That way, your strides are longer, and your, you know, so yeah, you don't get all knotted up. You know exactly. But um, Mike, you're the best. Thanks for doing the podcast, and hopefully, we can talk again soon. I, I'm off to Texas. If you guys are listening, I'll be in New Braunfels, Texas, and San Antonio this week. Come check me out, and uh, all the information is on my YouTube channel. Read the description, and you shall see it. And thank you, Mike, once again for starting that party in our ear holes. Oh yeah, thanks, buddy. See you next time. You got it, buddy. Later. We're done with this interview, guys. Like I said, if you want to. Uh, you know, bless the pockets with a little something, something. You can do that. PayPal, DarrenCarter.com. I'm also available on Cameo. I will do a video shout out on Cameo. Go to Cameo.com slash official Darren Carter. I just filmed one two days ago and I'm keeping people happy. And guess what? There's free delivery. It's very easy and fun to do. And I'll do it for you. You just tell me what to say and we'll do it. So go to Cameo.com slash official Darren Carter. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks again for helping out, uh, keeping my keeping me happy by uploading this podcast, keeping me happy by hearing your feedback and leaving comments all over the internet and telling your friends about it. And that's how this thing grows. I really do appreciate it. All right, guys, we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Darren Carter, party starter. Start that party in your ear holes. We know what this is. Everybody listen to Darren Carter We all know he's the party starter So if you want to listen to a podcast for free Then listen to The Pocket Party